Yesterday we talked a little bit about why, why, what motivates you to do this? You're a successful entrepreneur, you're your identical twin brother, who's probably in the crowd, but maybe that's why I thought you were here all the time, there's, there's two of you, um, is also successful. Uh, you, you were born in Iran. Tell us the story, because I think it, it's interesting to get a perspective of what, why you're passionate about this and why you find it so important. Yeah, the reason I started Code.org is because my personal story is one about, frankly, opportunity in the American dream. Uh, I grew up in Iran, and I had to live through the Iran-Iraq war. When I was six years old, the country broke out into revolution, and my, my neighborhood was literally one of the bombing targets for Saddam Hussein's uh, airplanes. And so I spent six years of my childhood spending every night in a basement holding my ears, hoping that our home wasn't the one that would get hit by a bomb. And the next morning, we'd go up to the roof and look and see which, which of our neighbors were still, were still there, which is basically the crappiest way you could envision a child growing up. Uh, but my life changed when my dad brought home a computer and my dad was a physicist, and he said, I want to learn how to code, and let's learn this together. And so my dad taught me coding and got me on my path to, to learning computer science. So when we came to America as immigrants, my family had almost no money, but my twin brother and I were really good at coding. So even when we were 14, we started working at tech companies uh, to help you know, make some money to help pay our way through school. How did you get uh, a job when you were 14? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't quite legal for us to work, but it's a... <laughs> uh, you know, it's part of what happens in tech, which is that it's so hard to find good people in this place that they're like, whatever, these kids are 14, if they could do the work, we'll figure it out. Uh, um, but either way, I've now had such a fantastic career, uh, and I feel so fortunate that, I, that I have the, the, I've made enough money that I can choose what I want to do. And I realized I'm, I'm a poster child for the American dream, and the American dream today doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel the same for people. And a big part of that is that most people's data are not gonna, most people don't have a dad who's gonna teach them how to code because our dads didn't learn how to code themselves either. This is something the school system should offer. Right, right. So you have 40 states represented here, um, many policymakers that could, could actually not only sign the code but actually act on it in a way that would accelerate this, uh, this, um, this movement. What are the three things, you have, a, you have a list, maybe you want to go through all six or seven of them, but what are the top three things that people should do beyond signing the pledge? Uh, sure. Yeah, pledging to expand computer science is easy, but uh, we actually, if you visit code.org for a state policymaker, there's nine different ideas that, that we suggest, but there's three of them that are really the most important and really easy to understand. Uh, the first one is to simply make a commitment that, and this could be a multi-year commitment, not an instantaneous one, but to commit that every school in our state should at least offer computer science and to, to basically put a stake in the ground that by, by 2020 or by 2022 or by this date, every school will te teach computer science. And then the next two things are to set standards to define K through 12 standards for computer science. And the third is funding for training teachers because the hardest challenge in getting every school to teach computer science is the shortage of teachers. And we don't need Google engineers to become computer science teachers, just like we don't have surgeons coming in to teach ninth grade biology. Teachers are all we need, and we have the teachers. We just need them to learn how to teach this new field, and it takes only 10 days in high school. It takes only two days for an elementary school teacher to become a computer science go, teacher. Go through that a little bit, 10 days for an art teacher to become a computer science teacher. I, I don't know, I'm, mark me down as skeptical, to be honest with you. Yeah. So you, you explained that, because I asked you this, and you explained it, and it's probably important for everybody to get a sense that it, it, is, it is possible, and it's being done right now all across the country. Yeah, it, it's, it's surprising, but it's true that within just a matter of, I mean, 10 days is a long time to spend all day, uh, but uh, within 10 days we've taken teachers from any field and made them computer science teachers. And not just, we don't know what they're teaching, they're teaching AP computer science and delivering test results, uh, which is you know, the, the sort of the gold standard in measuring what could be done. Uh, and the reason that's possible is because when they become computer science teachers, we don't tell them you know, how to become an expert and how to lecture those students. We also flip their, their method of teaching in two ways. One is we get them to embrace inquiry-based learning, and the second is we use blended learning, because computer science, there's gonna be a computer there too, so the computer can play a role. So the way it works is the teacher doesn't lecture and, and deliver the expertise that they never had when they were growing up. Instead, the teacher asks a question, uh, and I'll give an actual example, because this is, this is a, a great example. We have, for teaching how the internet works, we have an exercise where the teacher gives two students a, a, a long length of string and then gives one student a message. 
and then says, try to use this string to transfer this message to the other student and come up with a way to do that. And you can't speak to the other student. You can make a plan about how you're going to transmit the message, but then using the string, you need to get a message across. Uh, and then every set of students in the, in the classroom tries to figure out the teacher doesn't even know the answer themselves because they're not a computer scientist. And then afterwards, they play a video with Vint Cerf, the founder of the internet, explaining how he solved that problem. And so the, this inquiry-based model involves asking questions, and the teacher's role is really a facilitator. And because it's computer science, we have computers in the internet to deliver a lot of the learning over the internet so the teacher can actually pipe in an expert into their classroom. So in our country today, both politically, socially, culturally, you know, we have these new terms that uh, we're disunited. And we have these new terms, fly over America, the blue coast where you hang out. You know, there's big differences now, uh, both economically, culturally, socially. Um, and a lot of people here represent rural areas. And tell us how a art teacher or a math teacher, we have, a, we have the edu ed commissioner in Alaska who has a school district larger than the size of Indiana, That's who has, uh, I mean, is, is this a chance to kind of leapfrog over the old way of doing things to a totally new way of doing things in a, in a place that is where access to the internet, if you have that, you can recreate education? Um, I, I think this is, computer science is a great equalizer. Uh, and frankly, for myself as a Middle Easterner coming to this country, I, I didn't always feel welcome, uh, certainly not in, in seventh grade right after the hostage crisis. And this is a, is a skill that, if you're good at it, the computer doesn't care whether you're poor or wealthy, whether you're black or white, whether you grew up in a suburb or whether you came up from a rural or urban, urban neighborhood. The computer doesn't care. If you, and if you make an app, when you use an app, you don't care about the color of the person who made that app for you. And so it's a great equalizer. And it's also an opportunity to leapfrog, as you said. Uh, and that leapfrogging is happening in many places. You know, the, the state in this country that is leading the country in computer science is not a blue coast state. Uh, I would, I would, people would imagine it would be California or Washington State or New York, but the state that leading this is Arkansas, which has a, a great rural population. Uh, and in fact, there's a guy here named Anthony Owen who's been working with Governor Hutchinson there and has been leading from Arkansas and setting an example for the rest of the, of the country. Uh, by the way, we should all give a round of applause for Anthony because he's really done an amazing job. And I mention Arkansas because people think, well, why are they teaching computer science in Arkansas? Because Google's in California and Amazon's in Seattle. But it turns out Walmart is in Arkansas. And Walmart's competing with Amazon. And meanwhile, Amazon can't hire enough technical talent in Seattle. And it doesn't feel like it has the right political sort of uh, system in the city of Seattle. So Amazon wants to change headquarters. And they've said among the things they're looking for is a city that has great computer science education in its school system. Every state in this country needs talent that learns these skills. You brought up an interesting point. You, you had the picture of our uh, President Obama and President Trump together. I think that's the first time I've s seen them together. That's a <laughs> both smiling. Striking the picture. They, they, were, they, they were very similar because they both wore blue ties. Beyond that, there's not much in common. But in this nope, very- Computer science is in common. Yeah, exactly. So in, the, uh, in this hyper-partisan world, trying to find the, 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 the intersection where good politics and good policy exists, this is one of them. Uh, I remember campaigning with Governor Hutchinson when he ran for, and this was like at the heart of his campaign, was to say, for Arkansas to advance, we're going to become the leader in computer science. As a candidate, he said this. So, uh, and people, people are drawn towards this. They see, they see this, I think, in a, in a very compelling way. Yeah, it is. There's actually two, there's an interesting story behind that. The way Governor Hutchinson, before he was governor, he saw his granddaughter doing the Hour of Code on code.org. Ah. And he's like, if my 11-year-old granddaughter can do this, why aren't our schools doing it? And he actually looked at the advocacy materials on our site and copied them directly into his campaign and said, this is one of my campaign promises. And his opponents started accusing him of plagiarizing because he copied exactly our, our stuff. And we announced, we can't get behind a candidate, but we want everybody to plagiarize as much as possible. Uh, and so he won the election, and three months later, he, he delivered on his promise. Uh, just, just recently in New Jersey, the new, the new governor uh, similarly did a similar thing, campaigning with computer science as part of his campaign and just won, won the election. Uh, so I really believe this is a unifying thing. And it, it isn't about which party you're on. It's about whether you're 
stand for the future for our children and for our economy. So Adi, where, what, are, what are the roadblocks? Where, if, if someone wanted to implement this, a governor with the support of the legislature, where do they find the roadblocks to faithfully implement um, your vision of how this should work? Uh, the biggest roadblock is the mental idea that we can't do this, that it's hard, just the, the sense that education is, is hard to change. Uh, and that's partly about each player in the system thinks that the other players can't do it. The administrators think, oh, our teachers won't be able to teach computer science. I can't tell my schools to do this. The school's thinking, oh, I don't know if these kids are going to be able to do computer science. The teachers in the classroom thinking, oh, well, we could do it, but the administration will never catch up. What they don't realize is actually everybody, if you got them together, everybody agrees on this. Uh, and the administrators I speak to, they all want to do it. When you ask schools, the teachers, the majority of teachers think computer science should be required for every student. And the students love it. They like it more than most of the fields that they see. Uh, so that, that mentality is the biggest roadblock. The other roadblock is this teacher training, even though it's 10 days, it costs money. Uh, it's a fantastic return in terms of an investment. You know, in a state like Arizona, there's, there's $1.5 billion of currently open salaries and jobs that we can't fill in this field, and it would take $10 million to, to, change, to train these teachers for 10 days each to, to create an education system that leads to 1.5 billion jobs. Uh, and in every state, it's a similar, you know, simple math that a small amount of investment can unlock opportunity. But that money is difficult. If you're in a legislature, yeah. allocating funding for training computer science teachers feels challenging because money's is not easy. Is there a lot of philanthropy behind this? Code.org is, is you know, well-funded, and we are probably the leading uh, donor and philanthropic effort for doing this. And in fact, in almost every state in the country, we are paying the cost of this professional development. Uh, so the numbers I showed you come from our work. Uh, so in pretty much every state, we're, we're investing in retraining of teachers, and we're footing the bill. Uh, Don't say that in front of all the people that could approve. No, I was, there's a but. But we can't foot the bill for the entire country. And in fact, we're now going to states saying, how about you foot the bill, or you foot half the bill, or how can we go from what we've done to make it 10 times to fill the entire state? Yeah, I was so. thinking maybe matching grant program. Good way to get the legislature going. So, any questions? We have microphones. Where are the microphones? Way in the back. Yes, way in the back. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm Teresa Chastain. I'm CEO of Win Learning. What a great presentation. So my question is, what are your thoughts on blockchain technology and if it can improve education? Wow, uh, the question about blockchain. And I thought artificial intelligence was, uh, <laughs> the blockchain is probably the most abstract and hard to understand uh, thing going on in technology right now. And if, uh, if you're not familiar with the term blockchain, that's the technology that powers this new uh, currency called Bitcoin, which is going through probably one of the weirdest spikes of, of financial growth. Uh, the technology that supports Bitcoin is a very transformative technology and that's going to be impacting lots of things, uh, including education. But uh, I don't think it's at the level that people in this room should start either worrying about it or changing their practice behind it. Uh, if it impacts education, it'll be in, in the next generation of the LMS systems or SIS systems or you know, other sort of test score management things. The blockchain basically enables you to trust, have better trust in what a computer system does, whether it's a cryptocurrency or a voting system or a student information system. But it's not something anybody here would need to figure out. It just needs, means the, the people who sell you that technology one day might say that ours is more uh, dependable because it uses a blockchain. Uh, I don't think we should be teaching blockchain in schools yet. But thank you for that question I've never heard before. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Giselle. I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, have you made any attempts to talk to the schools of education <coughs> about doing the training as part of the money we spend on training teachers? That's a fantastic question. Uh, and. I have an incredible stat about this, which makes you think about the opportunity versus the, what we're actually doing. Uh, if you look at what our schools of education do, it's, it's a natural answer to have the schools of education prepare 
the teachers of the future to teach the students the skills of the future. Uh, we've been doing this for four years, and we've tried to, to talk to schools of education. Last year, schools of education prepared 25,000 new STEM teachers. Do you know how many of those were computer science teachers? Out of 25,000 new STEM teachers, 75 were computer science teachers. Yeah, I wouldn't waste your time. Yeah. Um, now, the challenge is schools of education the, the challenge is schools of education don't decide as much. They, they want to put out new teachers. State policies for teacher certification are what drives what the schools of education teach. So in any state, if you said to be a, to be a certified K-8 teacher, you need to have at least this amount of computer science from your school of ed, or to be a science teacher, you need at least one computer science course, a, a state can change its certification rules. And as soon as they do that, the schools of education, their universities, they have a computer science class. They just don't have teachers going into it, and they're not going to force the teacher to do that, uh, but state policy could. But they could also I could just have add, what about professional development money? That's exactly, when I talk about the 10-day training thing that we said, that is exactly what, what we're talking about. I, don't, I didn't use the word professional development, uh, and the reason I didn't say that is because most policymakers, when they do professional development, is to teach a math teacher how to be a better math teacher, uh, or a non-common core math teacher to become a common core math teacher. Uh, and in policy making, the money you spend on PD almost feels like you don't know what to show for it. We invested a million dollars in PD, and now we have the same number of teachers. You know? uh, and I'm not trying to say that PD doesn't work, but it's hard to measure what happened. Whereas when you spend your PD money on preparing computer science teachers, you, ha you used to have a math teacher, and now you have a math teacher who teaches computer science, which means you had a school that had no computer science, and now you have a school that offers computer science. Yeah, that's the power and of this is the force multiplier effect of using technology to train someone who's already skilled at one job and continue to do it and also do this. If we wait for the schools of education, I'm talking about elephants, they have a gestation period that's way beyond the gestation period of an elephant. I mean, we'll, we'll be here 15 years from now, and we'll have 80 teachers as the, you know, <laughs> graduates instead of 75, so smart to stay away from them. Yeah. Steve Roberts, uh, State of Kansas Board of Education. Uh, I'd like to ask my best new friend from Iran uh, if he agrees with two of my talking points that I described as simply telling the truth. You tell the truth, and then you let the chips fall where they may. The first is, you don't necessarily have to go to teacher's college to be a great teacher. <laughs> and the second nugget of truth is, when you get right down to it, teaching is not union work. For my friend from Iran and for my favorite governor from Florida. Well, first of all, Hadi's from California, just for the record, but you have a, a view on teachers? Uh, my view is that teachers are among the most important people we have in this country. They're doing the most important job in our country. Thank you. Uh, and actually, I don't just say that because it sounds good. We all know that teachers are underpaid and underappreciated. Part of what's made computer science grow so fast is the, the voice that Code.org continuously uses applauding the teachers for what they're doing to bring computer science into their classroom. So we, you know, we have had 700,000 teachers sign up to use Code.org, and we are so loving and appreciative of them. And they realize, wow, these folks love us. And this is a, this is a base of people who just feel underappreciated in their jobs. And one of the best things we could do for them is simply showing that appreciation every day. Yeah. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a big part. And they feel good because they're like, we're changing the system too. Uh, and we, we've been giving them a voice to create change. And it's been a part of uplifting them. Well, I think politically we get into the you know, all teacher, unions are teachers, and teachers are unionized, so therefore it's the same thing. And what we need to do is strive to appreciate teachers, treat them as professionals, and the union's influence will probably diminish dramatically if that was the case. Yeah, we are, what we're doing in computer science, I believe, is the only ed reform effort that has never once fought with a teacher union. Not once, and we've, we've worked in hundreds of schools, we're working in 40 different states, and even internationally, where there are also teacher unions. Can you put a good word in for me with Randy Weingarten? Just to... Yeah. Hi, Donna Johnson from Delaware, and we're very excited. We are launching our computer science standards for adoption in December. We've had a long going work with code.org, so I thank you for your participation and engagement in our state. 
My question is where we are still going to have a hurdle and are looking for additional ideas and suggestions is around that teacher licensing and credentialing. And are you finding that states are doing a better job with finding pathways for certification or are they using micro-credentialing and endorsements? What's working and is it working differently at different levels, elementary, middle, and high school? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, if you visit code.org, we actually have a policy paper on teacher credentialing because this is, this is a difficult thing for how to basically prepare teachers for credentials in a system where if you raise the bar too high, we won't have enough computer science teachers, but if you raise it too low, you know, we don't want something low quality happening in our classroom, and we recognize that there are multiple pathways. Software engineers could become great teachers if they have the right talent and if they go through PD about learning pedagogy and so on. Um, so if you visit code.org, you can see a, a, a document we have on that. If you find Anthony Owen from Arkansas in this room, they've, they are leading the charge, as I said, in terms of being one of the states that has done this really well, including a state that is rural enough that it's hard to, to do that teacher training. Um, I would also say when you ask about the different grade levels, in elementary school we could teach the basics of computer science, and that doesn't mean getting third graders to become coders, it means teaching third graders basic computational thinking like what is an algorithm, how to sequence a bunch of commands to get an outcome, and also teaching them things like digital citizenship or what's the internet and how does it work. Uh, the third grade level of stuff or the elementary school level of stuff, it takes one day of training, which is effectively a micro-credential. Uh, and that one day of training is incredibly cheap, and integrating this into elementary school is the easiest time to, it's when kids are soaking it up. Uh, a question nobody asked here is, how do you fit this in the school day? What, would, you know, what do you take out? Uh, and I actually want to answer that question because that's one that I get asked all the time, and as soon as you try to implement this, there's a question of how do you fit it into the school day? And the elementary school answer is the best example because in elementary school, uh, teachers aren't teaching eight hours in a row. These are like third graders, they're 10 years old. Uh, so teachers have to do some teaching and then some playing and then some teaching and then some playing or, or fun. You know, there's like learning, it's like math and now let's do fun and then let's do some reading and let's do some fun. Uh, and computer science fits into the fun category. So, and once you realize that, you realize that it, it's very different. You don't need to remove something. It, this, this you put it in instead of the sort of dance activity you were gonna have between the reading and the math. Uh, how about the, high school? In high school, uh, I compare it to biology class. Students aren't required to take biology. They have a choice of which science class they want to take. So if they have biology and chemistry and computer science, if they all counted equally towards graduation, which finally after the effort we've done in about 40 states, that's, that's the case, uh, the students get to choose what they think is, is the right course to take. And as long as you have a teacher offering that class, you, you satisfy that demand. Well, Hadi, thank you so much. What an inspiring message, and uh, we're delighted that you're here. Thank you so much. That's great.